from all your moonshiners if you want to hear about the kind of booze that they serve around here. Made Welcome back to Barley and Hops. I'm George, the channel that always attempts to answer all your questions and unlock the mysteries of home distilling or brewing, firming, whatever the case may be. We do our very, very best. Now, oh yes, if you get an opportunity, of course, subscribe, share us with your friends, like the video. Based on recent results, evidently the channel is doing very well and I owe that all to you. So thank you very much for all your support and for sharing us. Wow! Today is a great day for us and it's a great day for you. At least I hope you feel that way. Now, um, I've got the still set up, the same one that we did on the last, you know, we did the reflux. Uh, part one and part two. I'm going to run the same one here because again I've got all that extra mash left over and I've got to do something with it. It's not going to go bad. <laughs> uh, and we'll cover that. But I'm just using this kind of like as a backdrop. So we're going to cover a bunch of different topics today and hopefully we will get to your specific question here uh, very shortly. Ah yes, I'm out here answering email, checking on comments. Of course it, this is a normal routine on a daily basis so I've got quite a bit to go through. Well, okay, we're going to get rocking now. Um, this, I know, looks like a hot mess. Uh, it's, it's almost, you know, I'm not looking for the ooh-ah factor. You know, that, the ooh-ah factor, you know, that's, that's that factor that shows up when, like, you know, you find out your neighbor's building a thermonuclear device and you walk over and go, ooh, ah. <laughs> uh, no, this is, a, again, just a rudimentary setup. Uh, we're out here in the man cave. And um, I'm doing a lot of work here. And um, matter of fact, I'm working hard for you. So I'm trying to put together uh, some more information. And it's about the uh, uh, accessing the apps that we talk about. All right, we're gonna. I'm gonna show you exactly how to get to those apps that we talked about. And I'm here on the latest video that we published. And uh, I've got that. Uh, I'll stop that. And, you know, a lot of times I, I remark that information is below the video that's in this area see this it'll show up looking like this you just hit the show more button there's the app and I've pasted that onto the this is the information section below the video just click that app that link this is what will show up you can get the app on iOS or Android uh, it's either one so all you do here is just add your phone number send SMS link boom and now it's to my it's it's just showed up on my phone. So now you have access to it on your phone. Now there's there are other options. You can right click and go down send to your devices, and I can send it to my desktops or any other device that I have connected to this. And that's all there is to it. There are three different apps. There are, of course, the various apps. And when you open one of these, all three of them will show up. Time to heat app, and then the convert me app. Uh, all three are really useful, and as we work harder, we will get more out there. Um, I hope this serves you as well as it has served us. All right, now that you've got that out of the way, see, that's the very first part of this, but um, I've already set my PID to 162. I'm at 161, 162.5, uh, and it's bouncing around. I've got the water turned on. Uh, I put my air conditioner and cooler outside, and I run the hoses inside so it's a little bit quieter. Um, and I'm just going to run off my four shots and heads here, uh, but it's still it's a little bit too low. Remember, what do we do? We're going to run this all the way up until we get a production level. We're going to run it like a pot still before we turn on our reflux chamber up here. Yes, and we're going to meter the water in there. As well. You know that. We, we've already been through that on two videos, and if you missed that, there they are. Okay. Oh, well... Hey, as we as we work to get this, I'm, I'm balanced now, and we've we've gone through that long explanation. Uh, but I had a real quick quiz for you uh, to see if you were paying attention on those last couple videos. But and this is it just happened, and it, you'll be able to figure this out. Here's what took place: I had it set at 174. Things were running just fine. I turned on the water, and what do you think happened to the temperature? Yes, well, I turned on my reflux chamber and the temperature dropped. Now that was about oh seven or eight minutes ago and it started to come back up. My flow actually stopped and then it started to go again. 
because the temperature was too low and then the temperature started to come back up now but my PID is working really hard it's been working really hard I got it set at 174 and it's it it's having a hard time getting there what does that mean we talked about it that means I have just a little bit too much flow in my reflux chamber and I can see that my production is suffering from that because it's just it's it's trying hard oh now it's moving its way up it I'm gonna turn it down just a little bit because I don't need that much there and look at that immediately now I've got a balance of temperature I'm not 174.3.2 so I'm within two to three tenths of a degree of my set temperature voila problem solved thanks for tuning into that one if you answered the questions you passed the quiz well the first question that we're going to address is why does my proof drop during a run if I'm running in pot still mode we're all accustomed to that you know it starts off at whatever it starts off at based on your process because remember your process has everything to do with the proof and over a period of time in that run it starts to precipitously drop off until you're either out of ethanol or you decide to stop early enough that you're not collecting tails well there's two reasons for that really the most the most simple direct answer is is the volume in your kettle changes over a period of time you only start off with so much ethanol versus all that water that's in there and then over a period of time that volume changes matter of fact the volume of ethanol changes more dramatically than the volume of water so you've got less okay that's the simple answer but the true answer is to understand the blend of what they call it an azeotropic blend you've got two constituents in there primarily ethanol and water and it's a positive azeotrope so that means that the boiling point of that mixture will always be lower than the lowest constituent hmm okay so it'll be just a little bit lower than somewhere around 73 degrees Fahrenheit uh -huh. I'm sorry 173 degrees Fahrenheit or 78 degrees Celsius somewhere in that neighborhood okay that depend on which textbook you read uh, but I wanted to explain that to you because here's how this works oh this is a beautiful thing now I'm gonna draw a a, a, a graph for you an XY axis all right and this is going to be just our center point and just to make this simple now this is of course you get you know as well as I do you can draw graphs to say just about any darn thing um, here, here's how I describe it and I did this with someone over the phone and had them draw this on the other end of the phone and it just made perfect sense you draw yourself a smiley face here and then draw yourself another one here looks just like that we mark this one ethanol and mark this one H2O okay this is ethanol this is the water so in the very beginning of the run this is over a period of time and also temperature over a period of time at the very beginning your ethanol is the volume in that vapor it has more ethanol than it does water your water starts to drop off so you're actually producing more ethanol than you are pumping out water okay and during that period of time you know you've got this stuff that's happening you've got these molecules that are connected by the hydrogen bonds and they're being separated by the energy that you're pushing in but you know you've got two of them so over a period of time it gets harder and harder so it takes a little bit more energy all those things come into into play but basically what you look at here's what you're looking at you're looking at your ethanol swing it increases in your run let's draw a line straight up and down this is sort of like the peak that's the most where you have more and I'm checking on my jar you have the most ethanol and the least amount of water coming out of your still all right that's gonna happen right at your sweet spot when you first hit your sweet spot okay so in, in a lot of cases that could be anywhere between 173 and 184 uh, you know it, it all depends on your still your process how you're running 
But this is where you have your most ethanol. What happens after that? Well, over a period of time, as time changes, then your ethanol starts to drop off. Now, as ethanol is decreasing, water is, see that, is increasing. Hmm, what do you think that means? Yes, that means that your proof starts to drop a little bit. What does that require? Well, believe it or not, I'd, I'd say leave your temperature alone for a while. But if you increase the temperature, you'll increase the energy to separate those molecules and this will balance off again. But it's only going to balance off to a point to where it, of no return. It, it, just, it can only do so much. And then it's going to drop off again dramatically. And then you'll have the stair step. So, but what will happen is, oh yes, you'll notice that your ethanol is dropping. This is a zero, po zero point line. And your water is increasing. At this point here, it's called the azeotrope. It's where there's an equal amount of ethanol vapor and water vapor in a stream. That's why you can only get to about 95%, 95.4% alcohol by volume during a normal distillation process. You just can't get to 200. It's, it's not going to happen. So we're getting closer. So uh, now here's find your own. I talked with a gentleman on the phone. He had a perfect, perfect comment because I said, draw a line about right here and mark that 204. That's George's. That's my data point. That's 204, 100 proof. That's where I stop the still. He says, oh, so I got to find my own 204. Very, very astute. His elevation, his location, uh, his environmental conditions are going to make a difference. He needs to find his own 204 where this is the beginning of where tails may show up. You see, I stop at 204 and 100 proof, and I hit those two data points. I know that prior to that, the chances of me collecting any tails in my distillate are virtually, not impossible, but virtually impo uh, improbable. But, and the, of course, if you run it really, really hot, yeah, you'll get tails way up here in the front. You Just take it slow. Uh, after 204 and 100 proof in George's eyes is when, first of all, scientifically here, you'll notice that your ethanol is dropping, your water is increasing. You've got the same amount of energy going in, so a lot more is taking place in that kettle, and it's pushing, pushing, pushing. And then that's where some of your fusel oils start to get mixed into that vapor trail, and they're arbitrarily pushed out because there's nothing else that's keeping them inside the kettle. The energy is forcing them out. So your tails begin to show up. Uh, and some people can stop at 206. Some can go as far as 208. I don't know if I would ever go there, but it's totally up to you. But that's an explanation of an azeotrope. We use that word all the time around here. Um, and a rudimentary explanation of exactly what's happening inside your still. So you'll see, ethanol's increasing, water's decreasing. Certain point, ethanol's decreasing, water is increasing. Therefore, you're always going to have a change in proof during a pot still run. There we go. Jars switched out, hydrometer floating, 182 proof. Um, what more can you ask for? Still. 174 degrees, um, and my PID is keeping it right there. I haven't touched the water flow, haven't touched anything. We're going to let the next couple of quarts run out while we continue to answer questions. Some time ago, we, uh, we published a video on whiskey fungus. Uh, that trip I took to Scotland, and you know, it's that black fungus that just inhibits communities that are around distilleries and bonded warehouses. And we explained exactly where all that came from, or where it comes from, uh, what it is. It's, it's harmless, uh, but it's just nasty looking. Um, and it's prevalent uh, in communities everywhere around distilleries. Um, but I wanted to show you something here. And I'm, here, I'm going to show you this. It, here's where it's dripped a few times. And I wanted you to see that. 
You see that black? That's my own version of whiskey fungus here amongst my barrels. Uh, and I've got, these are three barrels here. I've got, you'll notice there's a blank space here. I'm going to show you that in a minute. I've got that on the table. Uh, but uh, I've got whiskey fungus, and that's the, the angel's share that is leaching out of the barrel in a vapor form. And it, 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 it actually provides the perfect environment for this whiskey fungus to grow. And you'll notice on the bottom of these barrels, that they'll be, you'll, you'll see that it's black. And you, you, you're probably wondering, why is it that way? It's natural. Don't worry about it. Yes, we were talking about whiskey fungus. Um, I'm just checking. Yeah, we're still at 174. It's holding steady at 174 degrees. Uh, this Again, this is just my rudimentary PID. Uh, if you get me to build one for you, it's going to look like this. That's the 240-volt uh, model. And uh, I mean, should you decide to get the 120-volt uh, model, it'll look like this. Oh, yeah. And oh, by the way, here's a picture of a recent build with a, that I did for a dual element to 5,500 watt elements. Uh, it's got a bunch more bells and whistles on it. Of, you know, it's, it's sexed up. It really is neat. Okay. This is the barrel that I use, or one of several barrels that I have. Uh, they don't last long around here for some reason. I got, uh, and so recently, oh, I wanted to show you this. See, here's my... I can just rub my finger across the bottom of here, and you'll notice that, yep, it turns black. I've got this black fungus all over it. Now, this barrel's been used, and you can see how it's black around the, the bands. This barrel's been used, oh, like four times. I'm down to about my last one or two uses of this barrel, and I can do one or two things. I can either, you can go back and watch the video, I can either pull the bands off, open it up, rechart, and put it all back together and use it again. I can do that. Uh, or what I like to do is I like to take and make something out of it. You know, I make a clock or, you know, an ornament of some sort because they're only around, but this, this runs you probably about 39, 45 bucks, something like that. And this is a small three liter model. Um, but I recently dealt in and bought myself a laser etcher and so I did. I started laser etching the barrels. This one says barley and hops. And this is a message to all of my friends that come over and want to take a snort. Uh, never take a sleeping bill on a laxative at the same time. I actually etched that right on there because uh, that's, for, uh, that's a message for all my friends that come over and call themselves tasting. Now, let's stick that back in there. What happens once you use a barrel and it goes dry on you or, or you get a brand new barrel? The first thing you do is put this puppy in the sink just like it is. Take the top bung off and fill it with hot water. Put the bung back in and just let it sit there. What you want to do is you want to swell those stays because there is no glue that holds these together. They're all a, a cooper, which is cooperage is the profession of making barrels. Uh, they make these and cut them in such a way that they just kind of hold themselves together with these bands. So you fill them with water so that they expand and seal. If not, you'll pour spirits in and it'll come right back out somewhere. Now trust me, all barrels are going to leak when you first get them. Don't, don't worry about that. It could take anywhere from 5 minutes to 24 hours, depending on how unsealed your barrel is, to seal it. And But remember, once you use the barrel and you empty it, um, the best way to preserve it and to store it is just fill it with water and put the bung back in there and put it on the shelf and just let it sit there. That way it'll stay sealed. Uh, if not, it'll dry out and it'll start to leak. Uh, how do you fix that? Put it right back in the sink, fill it with hot water, put the bung on it, and yes, you do have to clean them out. Next on the agenda! Yes, I've just finished bottling my last two bottles of my Saddleman's Cut. And because uh, that's all I had left in my own bottle, the other seven have disappeared. Yeah, that, those are my tasters. I uh, hope they bring the bottles back. Uh, so I've got those bottled. Um, and you'll notice in here I've still got some left, and I've got some medium toasted oak chips in there. Um, now I've 
age that on those oak chips, I did not use a barrel for these, which to me gives it uh, a little bit more of a, I don't know, it's hard to describe. Um, barrel aging is excellent for a really, really rich bourbon whiskey type. Um, and the Saddleman's Cut, uh, I designed that to be something that you stop in the middle of the day, you know, instead of having a cold beer, you can have a shot of that, and it's not as rich, um, but it's mellow, very, very mellow. And uh, so I've used glass jars and medium toasted oak chips. And I got these from, where did I get these from? I got these from Brew House, and this big bag will last you, oh my goodness, it only takes about three or four ounces, a, a good full handful. Um, to really do the job. So um, you just soak them, just put them in there and soak them and um, check them. Look, I walk by it every day. It doesn't hurt. You, you just can't help it. You reach out and grab the jar and you shake it because you like to see everything moving. Oh, I got some emails. It, you like to see everything moving around. That's okay. Just do that. But over a period of just a couple of days, you'll notice the change in color. Um, and then just leave them in there until you get the appropriate color that you're actually looking for, whether it's a really, really light goldish color or a little bit more opaque or maybe even a darker brown. Uh, you can add a little bit more uh, toasted oak chips. But remember, there is such a thing as too much. You don't want to take a drink and go, whoa, just, I just sucked down a tree. You don't want to do that. Um, American white oak and French white oak are the two basic woods that are used uh, commercially throughout the world that we find to be the most beneficial. Yes, you can use cherry. Yes, you can use birch. Yes, you can use, you name it. Um, but we tend to find that these do the best job. Now, I've also got some, here's another tip for you. Um, Brewcraft sells this is called finishing formula glycerin and this is in a small bottle this one holds I don't know probably about four or five yeah four ounces that's enough for two gallons um, I bought a big gallon of it and uh, so I got it in a small squirt bottle here and, and I'll add that uh, the dosage is about two ounces per gallon um, and what that will do is if you find that your finished product has a little bit of that burn on the back of your throat and you want to kind of smooth that out, um, start off with two ounces per gallon. It mixes really well. This is just glycerin. And it's in almost every food product that you either consume or put on your body. Uh, almost everything has some glycerin in it. So, yes, it's healthy and safe. Um, and... Uh, it will smooth out your shine. Now, uh, if it takes just a little bit more, okay. It takes just a little bit more. Uh, but please don't overdo it. Which leads me to my last point here. Um, is the, These are the three jars that we pulled off, um, what, two days ago when we did the step-by-step -step running a reflux still. So I've got 170, remember? Because we had a little bit of smear. Then I'm at like 185, 185 in that neighborhood and I've got to do something with this and today I think is the day. Uh, briefly, I'm going to cut it with some, I think I'll use spring water or you can use distilled water. It's totally up to you. Uh, I'll cut it down to 80 proof and I'll just do that by pouring it in or I might even use the calculator. Yep, one of the apps can do that. Um, so I'll cut that down to about 80 proof. Uh, and then I'll in, introduce that into a gallon jug. I think I'll add some medium toasted oak chips. Uh, of course, I'll use a little bit of glycerin just because I've gotten into the habit of doing that. Um, but this is a really, this, this is quality, I'll tell you what. I'm just happy with it. Okay, the next point that we're going to make for you today, and we want to try to explain briefly, and that is the use of malt extract. Brewers and beer makers are real familiar with this is a dry called DME dry malt extract and then you have LME liquid malt extract it's like a syrup they're both equivalent okay uh, the only difference is this is three pounds and normally your liquid malt extract will come in a can it's 3.3 pounds 
0.3 pounds of it is water. It, it's, a, it's a liquid. Um, these things are excellent. I'll, I'll tell you what, just make sure if you get one and you use it, don't get one that's hopped, okay? And that is, it, it, people ask all the time, George, can you distill a beer? You can distill a beer, and you will get the ethanol off of that. But the challenge is, is that the hops have such a negative effect on the flavor profile that it's not worth it. Uh, I have yet to have any, I've tried it several different times. And the hoppier the beer, the worse the spirit. Uh, so, yeah, lesson learned. Uh, but if you just get a, just a straight malt, ex, dried malt extract, you know, this stuff is excellent. I've got two packs here, and I'm going to make a mash out of this, or a wash out of this. So that would be six pounds right here. Six, pound, six pounds of dried malt extract is equivalent to, oh gosh, e easily, six pounds of corn sugar. Uh, so I'm already halfway there to my five gallon. All I got to do is add like what, four, maybe four. Maybe four and a half, five pounds of uh, um, corn sugar just to boost the alcohol by volume to bring it up to my 1.090. But this, and this is made directly, I know how they make it. I'm not going to try to explain it to you. It's, it's called atomization. They atomize. Um, the, this is made, ingredients, malted barley and water. Save yourself the trouble. Works extremely well. That is wonderful. Look, just please write in, what are your questions? What can we help you with? What do you think that we need to explain in more detail in order to make your experience in this uh, distilling hobby as successful as we can possibly help you make it? Yep, check in the jar. Now, last but not least, just a comment or a message about uh, communication. I understand I do get oodles and oodles of emails and I spend every morning uh, going through the emails and going through the comments and I try to answer them as judiciously as I possibly can. Please understand that my curtness or my brevity uh, short answers uh, in no way has anything to do with how I feel. Um, it's I'm trying to get to the next email of course. Uh, so if you write in and ask me have you considered this? Um, I may answer Yes or no. Um, there's nothing there for me to work with. I'm sorry. Um, but I just have to go to the next email. Um, if you ask a question, um, and, and I, I do, yeah, I go through them and read them. But if you, if you ask the question that's like way off base, uh, trust me, I'm going to skip that email and go to the next one that's got some body in it. Um, so, Again, it's one of those, if you're drinking and you decide you just want to send me a question, it, I may or may not answer that one. I'll get it, and I'll read it, but I may not answer that. Okay, I, I've said all I had to say about that. I will do my very best in order to answer each and every one of your questions, and most of you will realize that I will even call you if it's absolutely necessary. Uh, it is the questions, the comments, the interaction with the community that have made this such a wonderful experience and we endeavor to serve you as best we possibly can. Thank you, and yeah, happy to still it.